Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Wednesday and another session of Art Jam. Uh, I am Alex, and uh, today we're going to be playing with different stuff, I guess. Um, so let me first take a look and make sure everything is working. This is my second time doing a stream on my own, so hopefully you guys can see me okay and hear me okay. Um, if somebody out there can just let me know that things are working, that'd be awesome, uh, just as far as my audio. And then uh, I'm going to just make sure I got my software running, got some fantasy music playing. All right, awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, well, then, I think what we're going to do is kind of continue from where I left off last week, where I was in ZBrush and uh, had done a little bit of sculpting and retopologized something that now needs to be textured. And uh, so if I get my monitor up, there we go. Now you can see that. And let me get rid of that little overlay. Don't need to see that. All right, cool. Yeah, I just gave my dogs a dog treat, like these little rawhide bones, and they are making a lot of noise, chomping on those things. Don't know if you guys can hear them. Maybe you can see one right behind my the shoulder. Um, all right, so I'm in ZBrush, but I think to give a little bit of context, um, what I'm working on is a project that I did for the Unreal Fellowship. Those of you who were hanging out last week, uh, you know, saw me uh, talk about that a little bit. And so basically it's a project that I worked on in, I guess, uh, May and June. So for like five weeks, I did the Unreal Fellowship, which is hosted by Epic, where for me, I'd never used Unreal before. And it was an opportunity to have a crash course in it. And it was really cool. So me and a hundred professionals from all over the world basically got to learn Unreal. Obviously, Unreal is not what I have open right now. But if I go and switch, just open, let's say, the launcher, just so we have something Unreal related on screen. Let me just go to, let's say, Marketplace and let that load. There we go. Um, so yeah, so I played with Unreal for a while and I still you know, only know a little bit of the software. There's a lot left for me to learn. But uh, I was able to make a short. Um, but the idea I came up with the short, I didn't like fully get to all of it. So I'm still working on it. So I think what I'm going to do first is share that just so that uh, we're all on the same page. And uh, you guys can take a look at uh, my little Tartarus short. Um, and then let me figure out where I can play that from. There it is. And then we'll talk about that for a second. I'm just going to then jump back into ZBrush and texture with Mixer. And that's probably what we're going to be doing today. So I'm going to play my uh, Unreal Fellowship short real quick. Here it comes. Hopefully it works.
Uh, all right, so thanks for watching that. Um, I know I played it last week, but it's short. And I think for some of you who maybe weren't here last week, then uh, that's something that I recently did. And uh, so basically, I made that in Unreal. So Unreal 4, I know everybody's talking about Unreal 5 right now. Um, but that was made in Unreal 4 because for the Epic Fellowship, uh, Unreal 5 wasn't out when we started the Fellowship. And I know I have Maya up right now, not Unreal. We're going to get to that. Um, but basically, Unreal 5 came out during the Fellowship. But Unreal 5, as you may know, is still in beta. It doesn't officially come out till next year. And so because of that, they suggested that we stick with four. And uh, and there's another round of the Unreal Fellowship going on right now that just started like a week ago. And uh, for that fellowship, they're also recommending to that new group of 100 artists to stick with four. Um, because beta software is still gonna have bugs and is still gonna have issues in it. And uh, from a support perspective, Unreal 5 is out for people to try out for Josh. Yeah, Josh is doing the, uh, doing the fellowship right now. Unreal 5 is available for people to test, but it's not necessarily recommended to use in production or for people to use for you know projects that uh, they need stability out of the software. So I'll eventually jump to 5, obviously, and I can't wait to jump to 5 because of Nanite, Lumen, and the new features that are in there. But right now, my project is still in Unreal 426, and then 427 comes out soon, and I'll switch to 427 because that'll be a production release. Um, so yeah. So basically, um, for my project, I did start in Maya, and there's some stuff that I didn't get to in the project. And so basically, what we saw in the short is that he gets to the cave entrance, but he doesn't go into the cave, uh, even though that is part of my original storyboarded uh, animatic for my short. And so if we look inside what I have in Maya right now, as I started by just doing, you know, some block and drawing so I could do a layout in Maya that would then go to Unreal. So I have a drawing just to help me with scale, knowing that the guy was gonna start on a cliff, go down the cliff, cross the bridge, as we can see here, you know, enter a cave. Um, and so I have these drawings in Maya to scale. So you can see if I zoom in here, I actually have like a little, you know, generic dude uh, as scale reference. Um, because this guy is 180 centimeters tall. I have Maya in centimeters, Unreal is in centimeters. So from a unit perspective, everything's going to match. And uh, and so it allows me to kind of block things out and then start blocking out simple geometry. So basically where we got to in the short is we got from up here on the cliff, along the ridge, down this, across the bridge, and to the cave entrance. And so now we need to go down the cave into the underworld, basically. Um, and uh, so that's kind of work on what I'm working on now. So last week I showed a little bit of my progress, but basically in the under underworld, there's going to be a chamber at the end of it. If we get a little bit closer to that. And so, and we can see that in that chamber, if I go to a scene where I blocked it out, so let me open this scene in Maya. And let's go to the camera I have in here. So this uh, sketch that I have in the background is uh, from my storyboards. And so once we get to this chamber, um, there is an open chamber with this large skull and then a automaton kind of like a, uh, uh, machine man will sort of come out and confront our character uh, who's trying to get into uh, the chamber through the skull so that he can uh, take a use a portal to get to Tartarus, which is basically the underworld or Hades in you know ancient Greek mythology. So for the scene, I basically had to uh, block this out. And so, uh, I use Maya for this as opposed to Unreal because I'm very familiar blocking out scenes in Maya and you know matching the perspective and that stuff. But it's all done with fairly simple geometry. And then you can see all of the characters in here are for scale reference. Um, so yeah, so I've got the geometry that's kind of all ready to be uh, sculpted in ZBrush is what this is. And so uh, I need to make the skull, I need to sculpt these walls. And then outside of this space, if I go to another camera, then obviously there is the entrance into the chamber. And that's kind of what we worked on a little bit uh, last week. 
And here I'm going to go and just get this little music to be playing in the background just so I have something to listen to. But yeah, and I opened one Maya project file. I'm now going to go to a later one for my block out. Let this load. So yeah, so we took this piece of geometry last week, which is basically the cave entrance and went over the ZBrush. And then there's this larger area that we sculpted but didn't finish. And then there's this even larger area because we're in a huge chamber that's sort of like going to get us to the underworld. And so what I'll also show you guys, because again, I just feel it's good for us to all be on the same page, is I will launch Unreal. So let's go, but let's see, what am I going to open in Unreal? Let me go and find, let's see, let me go to Unreal, Projects, and I'm going to open up, let's see, Stair test, maybe. Let me go to library. Yeah, we're going to open this guy. And obviously, if you guys have any questions on stuff, you know, feel free. Um, trying to keep an eye on the comments and uh, but ultimately today, it's, I think, going to be some ZBrush, some Mixer, which is uh, from Quixel, from Epic, for texturing, which is what I use to texture a bunch of this stuff. That was in the short. All right, so here we go. So now I'm in Unreal. All right. So we're now basically in that chamber. And so you can see that things that are started in Maya with just really simple geometry do ultimately all end up in here. And so if I go and hit play, this is a work in progress. But basically, these are the stairs that the guy needs to get down. And then I still need to set dress this whole area. So this is just me still experimenting with how to do the stairs. And then he will traverse across this dark area where I still haven't finalized the lighting or the fog. And then he will end up in this chamber that I had over in Maya. So now I'm going to go to ZBrush. And this is what we did last week. And so I blocked out the uh, entrance. And then after blocking it out, I also blocked out what the cliff wall will be around it, which isn't finished yet. So I still need to work on this a little bit more. And then this stuff needs to be textured. So it's like, you know, a uh, simple block out or layout in Maya, and then sculpt in ZBrush, texture in Mixer, and then send that stuff over to Unreal um, for scene assembly. It seems to be the pipeline now. Um, so yeah, so let's go and hide this outer wall. And then what we did with this guy last week is, if I switch over to the high-res sculpt, I don't need to be like super perfect on the sculpt because it's going to be very dark in there. And so the lighting is not going to call too much attention to the sculpt. So I was able to sculpt fairly quickly and use textures to kind of add all of the detail as opposed to doing high frequency detail in ZBrush. Um, it's kind of a little faster to just do it in Quixel Mixer. Um, Eduardo, does Tartarus have a back, background story? It does. The, uh, the character that you saw in the short is basically his, the general premise, is that the goddess of uh, sorrow, who basically absorbs our pain so that we can forget about our own grief and suffering and move on from things like the death of loved ones. Uh, she um, uh, has basically taken his wife. Um, and so his wife has basically died a premature death 
and he's going to the underworld to try and get her back. Um, and there's much more to the story to it than that. But that's the basic premise is he's on his way to the underworld to confront the goddess of sorrow. And uh, yeah. So the premise that they gave us was the word conflict, which is very open-ended um, because you can kind of make anything with that. So I really just wanted to do a journey. Um, I wanted to do something where basically I could have an excuse to build an environment because that was the main thing I wanted to learn how to do in Unreal was to learn how I could do that. Uh, meaning the whole process of Maya, ZBrush, Unreal, texturing, materials, lighting, fog, all those kinds of things. Um, let's see. The I live in a nightclub. Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got a lot of Philips Hue lights. Uh, what's the learning curve like for Unreal? Did I, what did I find the hardest part to get used to? If you already know a program like Maya, it's not that bad. Maya, Blender, Max, you know, it's, it's all of those tools are fairly similar. If you're comfortable with modeling, texturing, lighting, rendering, what you'll find is that uh, you're still going to need to use other tools like Maya and ZBrush a lot um, or Substance Painter or Mixer. Um, but yeah, the learning curve, I would say, is pretty relatively quick. I mean, I'd never used Unreal before, and in a month, I was able to make that short. And I don't think that that would be true if somebody like learned Maya in just a month. So I'd say it's fairly intuitive. Um, is it difficult to learn all of this? I mean, it depends what you how you define all of this, you know, because ultimately, if you're completely new to 3D, then you just sort of start at one step at a time. Meaning, for example, you might start and just learn ZBrush and learn how to sculpt. And so that's something that I really recommend for younger artists that are new is uh, if you like art and you like drawing and sculpture, give ZBrush a try um, so that you can focus just on sculpting and sort of uh, evolve from there. If your interest is making things like creatures or characters or environments. Um, all right. So we have this, but this is the heavy mesh. And so it's you know, two and a half million polygons. And it's probably actually higher if I go to the highest subdiv. Oh no, it's at the highest subdiv. So it's two and a half million polys. Obviously I can't send two and a half million polygons to Unreal. You can with Unreal 5, but not with Unreal 4. So I needed to retopologize it and so and UV it. And so we did that in ZBrush using the Z remesher tool. And so this tool right here in ZBrush allows you to remesh something. So you can see that the topology or the wireframe of the polygons basically flows with the shapes. And so that is an optimized form of the polygons to sort of maximize um, the usage of poly count, count. And for certain things, it's very important that you have a nice topology, especially for things that are gonna be animated like a character. But for something static like a rock, it doesn't matter that much, but it's still a good idea to retopologize things so that it's easier to UV it. And UVing it just means that we can wrap textures around it. So we did that in ZBrush also using a plugin called UV Master. And so UV Master, let's go over here and let's pull that over here. So is a ZBrush plugin that allows you to UV stuff. And so what that means is that if I now take this piece of geometry and I go and apply a texture to it in ZBrush, you can see that this image is able to wrap around the model. And so that basically means that this has UVs. Um, there's always going to be a seam somewhere unless you're UVing something like a plane. And so to see the seam better, I can go and use a texture like this. And you can kind of see where a seam is. So there's a seam right there. We can see that there's a seam there, but that's okay because using Mixer will be able to texture that uh, without a problem. Again, it's gonna be dark in the scene that we're working in. So what I wanna do now is basically move on from here where we got to last week and let's bring this into Mixer and see if we can get this thing to be textured. Um, so, Man, I really gave my dog something loud to chew on. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but he's chomping. So this is uh, 15,000 polygons, this mesh that I have open. It's not that heavy. And I'm going to export it.
So let's go to export. I'm going to turn off group, uh, which is just a setting that I always use for exporting. And I've done it for so many years now with ZBrush that I, you know, it's just a habit. And I'm now going to go up to where it says export. And I'm going to go to my Maya project. <clears throat> so things that are being blocked out in Maya, I'm leaving in a Maya project while my Unreal stuff is in a Unreal project. And so I'm going to go to Maya projects Tartarus. I'm going to go into data. And these are directories that I've created because what you see here is a standard Maya directory structure. So like the scenes directory, the textures directory, source images directory. Um, and in the data directory, I created a directory called from ZBrush. And I've got all sorts of different things in here because these are things that I made for the short that have been worked on in ZBrush and then exported out of ZBrush. And so I'm now going to go in here and say, all right, well, what am I going to call it? This is the chamber entrance. And it is 15,000 polygons. You'll see on a lot of these, I put that in the name of the OBJ when I export this. So like bridge arc support 25K or cliff A 29K. Um, it's just a habit I have for naming that helps me know how heavy something is. Um, I'm just gonna call this chamber entrance 15K OBJ and I will export it. All right, so now that's out of here. And then I'm going to go to Maya, so let's go over to Maya, and let's import that in here. So Ruben, hey, I graduated from Noman. was told I'd always have access to Noman computers. Is that true? What do you mean, access to Noman computers? Access to the labs? I don't think that's really ever been true. I mean, you're always invited, welcome to swing by. But labs, obviously, um, are basically for current students. People who graduate sometimes use them a little bit after graduation. But uh, that's what you're referring to. Um, I mean, like the data and new stuff. Like what data and what new stuff? data because there's something specifically that you're looking for from the rush chamber entrance 15k there it is important okay so now we have this loaded in here and so we can see that it came in in the correct location so here is what we sculpted or rather poly modeled something super simple and then basically we can see what it turned to, into in Maya. So I'm gonna take this guy, the one that I blocked out, and I'm gonna hide it off its visibility. So now we can just see this. And then uh, if I select it, I'm gonna go to Window Modeling Editor, UV Editor, and we can see it's got UVs. So I could go and adjust the UVs if I wanted to. Like we could see that there's, this isn't like super optimized. There's a lot of empty space in the UV layout. And if you were trying to optimize things, you would try and pack the UVs a little better than this is. But for the perspective of doing uh, what I'm doing, I don't particularly care about the file size of my project or um, having, you know, I have a lot of VRAM on the graphics card I have. And so I'm not too concerned about it. So I could shrink this down a little bit if I was worried about issues with light maps, because if you bake light maps in Unreal, then um, it's recommended to have some space between your UV shells. And this is kind of touching the edges, but I'm not too concerned about that either based on where this is going in my project. So this basically is something that I could use as it is. I am going to smooth it. So I'm going to go to, uh, in my, I'm just going to go to soften edge. So now this thing is not faceted anymore. And I'm going to delete history on it. And 
I don't know if you guys hear this chomping that my dog is doing on the ground right next to me, but it is so loud that I'm going to put my dog outside. So give me one minute and I'm just going to let them be free. Come on. Oh, that's much better. It was just chomp, 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 slurp, chomp. So oh, that's cool. You guys couldn't hear it, but I figured like, oh, I'll just give them a snack so that they uh, leave me alone during the stream. Anyway, um, I started with the blender and I have other software to learn. Should I leave 3ds max for last because it will be faster to learn because of blender? Uh, well, why do you want to learn 3ds max would be my first question. Um, if you're looking to get into like, you know, ArcViz, 3ds max is popular, but if you're looking to get into the entertainment industry, I would recommend that you're good to start with Blender, might as well, it's free. If you want to end up at a visual effects studio like ILM or Weta, it would make more sense to learn something like Maya than 3ds Max. Um, and then obviously there's um, Unreal if you're wanting to get into games. But even with Unreal, like I was saying, you still need to know something like Maya for modeling and UVs and character rigging, like there's no character rigging in Unreal um, effects. Uh, things like Maya and Houdini, you know, there's there's our effects tool and, and Unreal, but they're not as powerful as what you find in Maya and, and Houdini. All right, so I've got this piece of geometry in here. If I zoom out on this project, we can see other examples of things like that. So for example, if I zoom in here, you can see other things that were ZBrushed. So like the entrance to the cave that you saw in the short is all ZBrushed this way and then textured. So that's what we're going to do now is we're going to try and take this thing that we sculpted and bring it into Mixer and see if we have any luck. And what I did a lot on my project is I um, tried to reuse Mixer um, projects that I used for other objects on new objects. So the way I textured the cave entrance, if we're lucky, I can use that as a start point for this. So let's see. Let's export the selection and so i'm going to export this as an obj don't need material and so this is now going to go into the data directory so this is going to mixer and so quixel mixer so i have a folder called to mixer and i'm going to call this chamber entrance 15k all right and now let's go over to Mixer and see if we can get this thing textured. So, and then ZBrush, we can minimize and I'm gonna launch Mixer. So I showed Mixer a little bit last week. And as with Unreal, Mixer is free. Same thing as Bridge because Epic bought Quixel. And so I highly recommend giving it a try if you have things to texture. Um, it's really, really cool. And it's a fairly small program at the moment. They've been expanding it and adding features, but it's small enough that you can learn it in a weekend, you know, especially if you're comfortable with Photoshop. So what I have, uh, what it opens with when we launch Mixer is it's showing me uh, all of the projects that I've recently made with Mixer and asking if I wanna open one of those or make a new project. So obviously I could start from scratch with the object that we just exported from ZBrush, or I could use one of these as a, as a starting point and swap out the geometry with the thing that I just uh, made. So for example, now last week when I opened these statues, um, I got like an artifact on them, but let's uh, see if we get a statue or get a statue, get an artifact on this computer, because I'm on a different computer today than I was last week. So it's loading. I am swapping from VFX 
to games, trying to focus on environments, but I have zero knowledge in UE. How long would you give an advanced level CG artist to get comfortable level of understanding Unreal? Uh, well, again, I'm a Maya user for a really long time and been doing environment work with uh, Maya for years. And I got pretty comfortable with Unreal in about a month, but that was a month of like from when I woke up until I went to bed seven days a week, basically. So I kind of like obsessed over Unreal for about five weeks because of the Unreal Fellowship. So in a month, I was able to get comfortable enough to make that short, meaning how to import objects, get materials on them and light them. Um, and then also deal with some of the animation stuff that I needed to do. So I think that since you're not modeling in Unreal and you're not texturing really in Unreal, you're just importing things, doing scene layout and building the materials. Um, it doesn't take too long to learn that stuff, which is rad. Um, so yeah, what I want to show you is I'm going to go back to Unreal and I'm going to load a different project. Let's see, let's go to the launcher. I have a habit of being around a little bit, so I apologize for that. I'm just trying to like, when I get into new topics, I just make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm gonna go into my library and let's see, antiquity libraries, is that what I want? Maybe, let's see if that's what I want. So in my scene, I blocked up, I built the environment, right? Like the cliffs and the bridge and the cave entrance and all of that stuff. Like that stuff that I modeled, that I designed the environment, modeled it, ZBrushed it, textured it, et cetera. But all the set dressing, I didn't have time to do in a month. So I relied heavily on um, mega scans, meaning bridge and the model libraries that are available in bridge, which are all free, as well as some stuff that I grabbed from marketplace. And so what I'm opening right now is a Unreal project where different things that I downloaded from Marketplace, I kind of put into this project to see if they would be useful. Things like Greek statues or uh, Greek urns, uh, stuff that I might be able to place. And luckily, since the setting for my short was ancient Greece, um, there happened to be a lot of stuff in Marketplace that is Greek or Roman. And so that, um, saved me a bit of time as opposed to doing an environment that you would really be forced to start from scratch and make everything yourself because there aren't pre-existing libraries. But Greco-Roman stuff is a fairly popular setting. So while this is loading, I'm going to go back to Marketplace. So it always closes, uh, or rather closes, it always closes the launcher when you launch uh, Unreal, but I'm just going to reopen it. So yeah, so in here, if I go to library and I scroll to the bottom, these are all of the things that are in my vault. And the vault with Unreal is basically when you download something from Marketplace, it goes into your vault. And your vault is something that is part of your account. And then obviously you can download all these things to your local hard drive and then integrate them into your Unreal projects. So in just a period of you know the five weeks of the fellowship, you can see that I grabbed a bunch of things. I didn't use all of them, but a lot of these are free. And so it was cool to learn Unreal by taking things apart, which I highly recommend. And then some of these things weren't free, but still very much worth grabbing just to either use in my project or to uh, deconstruct and uh, learn how to build different types of environments. And what we'll see in here is I've got like this one called Ancient Statues, this one called Antiquity 3D, this one called Detailed Greek Statues, uh, this one called Ruins Pack. And on average, these things seem to be like between $5 and $20. <clears throat> and then again, a lot of them are free. So I did spend some money, but it was the only way to be able to get my short made in the period of time that we had. So for me, it was a new experience to use model libraries, but it was pretty fun. Are you still loading, still loading that project? I'm just gonna scan comments. So looks like I'm caught up. Yeah, sometimes things take a minute to load. So while that's loading, I guess I will just jump back to Mixer. 
All right. So basically what I have loaded is a Greek statue that I got off Marketplace that I retextured because most of the statues that I grabbed off Marketplace were either super clean, uh, like clean marble or bronze. And the texturing is super simple. So if I just turn this off, I'm just grabbing something from Mixer. And so in Mixer, if I go into the online tab and I go and look on the left, there's thousands of surfaces that you can use to texture your own objects and they're all free. And so basically you can browse this library uh, and then start layering these together. And so that's what's going on in the viewport. So this is my base that I then layered based on curvature, some dirt into the cracks. And then a little bit more dirt kind of coming in from an angle so it's not hitting the whole thing and then layered based on slope angle some, it's a concrete texture just to make it look weathered. And if I go and take a look at, let's say a different lighting situation and rotate the lights around, you know, it's fine. A lot of the texturing that I did on these things was done in a hurry. But the nice thing is once I had this one done, if you go into Mixer and you go to the setup tab, You'll see on the upper right, it says custom model. I'm using my own model and it's specifying the OBJ I'm using. So I can then load in a different OBJ and then this uh, texture set will be applied to that new model that I loaded in. And then I can just make a few tweaks. So if I load in another one, so let's go and grab a different statue. You're going to see on the layer set on the right, it's basically the same layer set or a stack of layers that's being applied to this model, but it's a different model. So just letting that load. All right. And so here we have this dude. And so you've got a few different lighting scenarios that you can use to preview things. And so shift and the right mouse button is how you rotate your light around. It's kind of like an HDR, but it's super useful to be able to do that. And then my scene is kind of like overcast. So there is an overcast preset in here, which is pretty useful. And so let's see, is Unreal still loading? You are still loading. I might have too many things open, but anyway. So let's go and open the cave entrance, which is th what I think I'm going to try using. And my computer is starting to get a little slow. I'm going to do a quick RAM check. So because the computer that I usually use has a lot more RAM than this one. This one has 32 gigs of RAM. So let's see, how are we doing? Yeah, we're getting a little tight on RAM. Let's see. I am going to see if there's anything I can close. I don't need ZBrush up anymore, so you can go away. And I don't need Photoshop open, so you can go away. So ultimately, you know, the computer that I'm using is an Alienware, and this box is like five years old, and it only supports 32 gigs of RAM, or else I get more. But uh, the computer at home I, has, I think, like 128 gigs of RAM, something like that. A lot more. Uh, da, 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 da. Is Mixer a replacement for Substance Painter? No, it's not a replacement. It's a, it's complementary. You know, you, you'd use both. You'd use Mixer for some things, and you would use uh, Painter for others. Because Mixer really is kind of, you can see here, where we have distinct textures from a library that comes from Epic, that comes from Quixel. And we're using this library uh, to texture, as opposed to Substance Painter, where you have all these painting tools that are not really in um, Mixer. And so, and now we have a freeze, which is awesome. This stuff happens. So, Control-Delete, Task Manager, 
we all deal with this stuff so it is what it is oh it just woke up yeah basically it's uh unreal loading in the background and so i think the project i loaded i kind of think i know what's going on the project i loaded has a lot of different things loaded in it because all the things i downloaded um i all put it to one project like all the different greek and roman things and so i think that's what's causing the issue and i don't really need that i know you guys don't necessarily want to wait too long for that so i'm gonna go i'm looking at another monitor right now so that's why i'm looking to the left but let's see you can go away all right so i'm gonna go back to launcher sorry about that but that's the nature of streaming so you're gonna see just things the way they are all right let me go into library let me load something smaller so basically what can i grab as an example so ancient statues add to project that would be fine i'm gonna make a new project this will launch fast um i am not using per uh perforce i'm just going to be working by myself on my own project and so for me it was easy to just uh do the file export as a zip and just uh version and backup that way and just with zip files of the whole project the nice thing with unreal is since everything is inside your project as opposed to maya where things can be scattered all over the place it's pretty easy to back up manually i know if i was working with a team it would be a whole different thing but for personal work it's fine so i'm going to create a new project i'm just going to do a third person and so this is just uh, all default settings for a new project i'm going to call this let's just say task create that project hello from lebanon this might be your answer Just like Vitaly Bulgarov. Yes, Vitaly is awesome. I think we all are inspired by Vitaly. If any of you are not familiar with Vitaly, I highly recommend looking Vitaly Bulgarov up. He's one of my favorite 3D artists, has been for a while. He's super talented. Now he's made a game called Mortal Shell, which has done really well, which is really cool. Vitaly's awesome. Um, you're 43, by the way. So, well, I definitely am a strong believer that age doesn't matter as long as you find something that you love to do. We've had students at Noman graduate in their 50s. So, all right, let me go back into the launcher. All right, let's see. I'm going to take this uh, ancient statues that's right here, and I'm going to add it to the project that I just made that's just called test. Uh, Jackal, if you look at the post, uh, I actually don't see it because you're on different platforms. Vitaly Bulgarov, and so it's uh, Alex F1 just posted his last name. Vitaly's Russian, and uh, he's been in the industry for, I want to say, at least 15 years. He was a blizzard for a long time, and then he left to be a, become a 3D concept artist and uh, just does amazingly cool hard surface stuff and is now has a video game studio. All right, uh, let's see. All right, so I just added to project. So in Unreal Speak, if you have something in your vault that you uh, have added to your account, then I can click on under H and Statues, Add to Project, and I can choose which project is going to add that asset to. And what that means is that if I now go into Unreal and look in here, on the bottom left is the content browser. And so this is basically, it's almost like browsing your project directory. And so in my project directory for this Unreal project that I just made, which is called test, then you can see there's now a folder there called ancient statues. And so if I now go and click on maps, 
then it shows me that there is a level that came with this asset pack. So if I double click on it, basically take a look at the market with this asset pack that I downloaded marketplace. And so, so it's now going to load that. Okay. If it's the first time you load a level, sometimes it takes, it takes a second to load because it needs to compile shaders and build lighting and stuff like that. And these are the things that, uh, you know, there's always waiting, even though real is super fast, you still wait for stuff. Let's see. While that's doing that, hopefully we will end shoe. I also don't think I need Maya up anymore for what we're doing. So I'm going to close out Maya. Save. Yes, we can save that. Yeah, I think I actually did order a new computer uh, that has more RAM. Something that uh, this has been an issue with this computer for a little while just not being able to have lots of program but uh because of covid it obviously takes forever to get anything so hopefully in the next month or two i have a computer with more ram if i could wish one cooler system or anything to be added to Maya, what would it be a better viewport so I think anybody who's using Maya right now is has serious viewport envy when it comes to Twitter and Unreal, because Maya's viewport, you know, is a sad state of theirs compared to what you see in a game engine. So obviously, Unreal is designed to, you know be real-time environment, so the view, viewport has to be awesome. But now, because of graphics cards being amazing and RTX cards and real-time ray tracing and all the cool optimizations that Unreal has done, it's making Maya's viewport really, really seem really sad. So, probably the number one thing I would say is, obviously, Maya is a 25-year-old pro, so the performance for viewport is something that needs to be improved. And then Blender, you know, the viewport there is pretty rad. And so that's Well, I'm sorry guys that things are being so slow today. Anybody have any other questions while we Wait for this. How close could I get to recreating the final render of something like Dirge and Unreal? That would be pretty easy. So I would say I could get 100% to matching that project. Because ultimately, that, you know, it's geometry with fog, uh, an animated character. Here we go. Uh, fairly straightforward stuff. And uh, but some of the things that are in Dirge, like the animated locusts, I still might animate those in Maya and bring those over to Unreal. But I think you could actually do that in Unreal without a problem. Um, and the fire that's in Dirge is all on cards, which I could do with Ember Den and put those on cards and bring those into Unreal. All right. So you can see examples of things that I used for Marketplace in here. So a bunch of really cool Greek statues. You can see it's cool that it comes in with three materials. So it's got basically like a clean marble and then something that's meant to be bronze, but is a little green. And then these, which I go into meshes and go into materials. We can see we've got bronze, copper, and marble. And so actually these green ones are meant to be copper but obviously very, very old and very, very weathered because it's completely green as opposed to having any copper look to it at all. But even though these are textured, I still felt like they didn't quite fit my project. And so that's why I wanted to uh, retexture them. And so something like this guy, we see what they look like here. This is the reclining figure. 
if I go into Mixer and go to Open, do I have that guy in here? No, I don't have that guy in here. But you saw some of the other figures. I'll just open another one. Let's see. Let's go back into Unreal. Okay, so like I used her, for example. And so let's go and select her. So standing woman, just go under meshes. So it's this one. So if I go into Mixer, let's see, which one is it? It might be this. Okay. You can see that ultimately I textured these in just a much more weathered, dark manner. So that's basically the idea. It's taking things where the model was fine, but I just wanted to retexture it. So let's go and open the cave entrance. And then we'll import the geometry from Maya and see how it looks. So I opened this scene uh, or this mixer project last week. All right. So let's see, displacement mapping is off. Cool. So this is the cave entrance. And so it's a few different things layered together. This may or may not work as a start point for the chamber entrance, but we'll give it a try. So I'm going to go to setup. And so where it says custom model is where I'm going to swap it out. So I'm just going to go in here. So Maya, Projects, Tartarus, Data, to Mixer, Chamber Entrance, where are you? So there. Okay. So now this is loaded. And so I can now decide how I might need to change it to get it to look the way I want, which is really a scale issue right now. So if I go under Layers, I'm going to go and turn certain things off and just deal with it one at a time. So this one we can see, this cracked rock has been painted out. It's got a paint mask in a couple spots. So I'm going to delete that paint mask. And then I'm going to look at placement. So in Mixer, uh, obviously you can control how one of these textures that's from the library is wrapping around your model. So it's got box projections, and obviously it's got UV projections. So right now, this one is being applied as a box projection. So the nice thing with box projections is that it doesn't matter if you have a lot of seams or UV seams, different shells, because it's going to project across those. Um, so if you're having an issue with seams, then it's nice to do a projection. So if I switch it to tiling, now it's only tiling or repeating this texture once. So I can then go and increase the repeats on this texture to whatever I want. And even though I know that there's seams on this thing, it's something that I'm maybe not too concerned about. And I'm going to go and play with the lighting in here. So for these materials that are coming from uh, Quixel Bridge, they all have normal maps. If you look in the lower right corner, and I know that my camera is in there. So maybe I can go and hide my camera for a second. Let's see. Where's that? Tink, 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 tink. Well, here we go. Now my camera's out of the way. So in the lower right corner, you'll see that uh, this Icelandic cracked rock 
has albedo, metalness, roughness, displacement, normals, and occlusion. So there's six different maps that are all 4K that are building this material called Icelandic Cracked Rock, which comes from this library, which is going to be one of these. It's this one right here, Icelandic Cracked Rock. So you have a little preview of it. And so if I look at it on my mesh, then that's where I can go in and adjust the tiling. So what we were seeing before was a projection on the model, which was just being repeated a little bit too much. Maybe, maybe not, depending what you're using it for. But as a base for this one, I'm just going to go and use Freeform and see if my UVs are going to allow me to do it with a tiled texture without any seam issues. Because I also need to look at this thing from the perspective of the little tunnel that's inside it as well. And here we can also see the issue of the seam. So you see this right here is where I have a UV seam. And so then the question is, do I care? Because since this is sort of like the bottom of this little tunnel, um, that probably is going to get covered with rocks and set dressing. And so that means I'm not going to be concerned with that. And so here, let me just go and get this to be bigger again. Um, but if I switched over to a box projection, then you can see the seam goes away because it's projecting the texture basically from like X, Y, and Z and blending them based on normals. And so now you don't see any seams at all. Um, I found with Mixer that the texture looks a little sharper with tiling as opposed to with the box projection. So I tend to try and tile it if I don't, uh, if I can get away with it. So I think I can get away with it here. Um, there's another spot where we can see, yeah, my navigation's a little funny in Mixer just because of the scale of my objects and where it's located in Maya and where it got imported from. That's just a funny issue with the way Mixer handles tumbling and rotating. But you can see the seam right there. I'm not worried about that either because I'm not going to see this in my final scene. It's going to have other stuff on top of it because this is not the ground plane. There's another ground plane in the scene. And that ground plane will intersect with this cliff wall along this edge. And then I will hide the intersection point with set dressing. So I'm not concerned about that little seam either. So really, it's a matter of looking at this and being like, OK, well, does this make my little cliff wall look rocky? So this is what we're starting with. So I'm going to go and turn that on and then figure out how many repeats I want. So I set it to four and four. I won't know for sure if that's what I want until I get some of the other layers on top. But it's definitely better than what it was at before. Maybe I'll just try and play with this as a base. And that's OK. All right, so the next layer that I have in here that I'm going to turn on is Icelandic rough rock. So I'm going to turn that on. And this one is also set to be a box projection. And this one doesn't have any masks on it at the moment. And so since it doesn't have any masks, an interesting thing with Mixer is that it again, again gets to looking at the way it blends layers based on what's underneath them. So when you only have a single layer at the bottom, you're going to see its albedo, metalness, roughness, displacement, normal, occlusion, uh, as they are on the mesh. But once you layer stuff on top, you intuitively might think that it would be 100% opaque and hide whatever is on the bottom underneath it. But that's not what it's going to do necessarily by default because uh, in the upper right corner, you can see we have blending. And you can see that it's opacity masked. And the opacity is 1. So if I lower the opacity on this layer down, you can see, OK, well, that makes sense. It's the opacity of this rough rock on top of the cracked rock for my cliff. Fair enough. But if I put that to 1, 
we're still seeing something of the cracked rock underneath. Because if I go in here and hide that, you can see the mesh is smooth. But this Icelandic cracked rock has a normal map associated with it that's causing it to react to lighting, right? You can see it, it looks like a bump map, normal map. So when I go and add this back and I get this to be visible, hopefully you can tell that the sort of cracks and the rockiness of the normal map on this base is still there when I bring this other layer on top. And that's basically because in here, you'll see it's got a slider called preserve details. And so if I play with that, then you can basically start to play with how it's, you know, uh, or sorry, not preserve details, wrap to underlying. So if I adjust that slider to zero, it's no longer showing the layer that's underneath it at all. But if you raise that up to one, wrap to underlying, it's basically taking the normal map from this layer and adding it to the normal map from the layer underneath which is cool. So basically you can get the detail from both of them. Hopefully that made some sense. Um, so now I have something that's basically changing the color of the whole thing, but using the detail of both. And so for this one, right now it's set to a box projection. I still need to think about the scale. So for this, there is a scale slider on this one. And so I'm going to go and play with the scale and see what I want. So I don't want the scale to be too small. You're going to start to see a repeating pattern. And also this thing is supposed to be fairly large. So I'm just going to adjust scale on this. Let me try, let's see, different lighting. And also right now, since we're just layering things up, it's all going to look pretty uniform. And then once I get these different layers together, I can decide where things are based on curvature and slope angle and stuff like that and hopefully get something that looks cool i don't know we'll see um so playing with the scale all right now i'm going to go up to the next one which is rock cliff layered okay so this one has a mask on it as well this is also a paint mask i'm going to delete that mask so a paint mask is something that is literally like a layer mask in Photoshop. So when I now got this one on, if I click that layer and I say, add a paint mask and I make the value black and I make the brush bigger, you can see that I can mask it out. And so meaning that now this layer called uh, rock cliff layered, you can see where it's going and where it's not going. So I can mask it out with a paintbrush and where I want. But for now, I'm just going to leave it everywhere. All right. So let's see this guy. Has a paint mask. And I'm going to play with its scale as well. I also can play with the angle of the projection. So if I want it to have like a sedimentary look to it, I might want to rotate it a little bit. and adjust the scale a little bit more. All 
I'm just going to look at this in a couple of different places just to see if it's looking okay from the back as well. And again, while I'm doing this, I'm trying to evaluate if I like it. Uh, I am thinking about the fact that it's very dark in my environment. So how brightly lit this is right now is not how bright it is in my scene. Um, another thing I should point out is texture resolution. So this is under my setup. I have my texture resolution set to 4K. So what we're seeing in viewport is a 4K texture. I can always export 8K, um, which may end up being what I need. But right now, Mixer uh, gives you a warning if you switch to 8K for your viewport display. So I'm leaving it at, at 4K, even though we may end up exporting an 8K. But it's kind of looking all right on the wall on this and here. So, so this texture that I have on this layer, you know, I may not use over the entire rock face. I may just use it for the tunnel because it's actually working pretty well in the tunnel. So really, I'm just like, for each one of these layers, making sure that the uh, angle is correct, the rotation is correct, the scale is correct for what I want, and then I can decide where, where, they, where they are. So now I'm going to go to this next one. Let me go and make this a little bigger. So this next one is Icelandic rocky ground. Okay. Now this one has not a paint mask, but a mask stack. So let's hide that and get that back on. And what that means is that this one, let's get a little closer to the cliff wall inside here isn't going everywhere so if we go back a little bit our first layer goes everywhere it's a base and so it's uh, has full coverage over the geometry and then this one has full coverage over the geometry as well but it's adding color as well as detail information into the normal map and then this one is layered on top of that as well and is going everywhere too. And then finally, this guy. So where is this one going? Well, this one called Icelandic Rocky Ground, if I click on it and go and look on the right, it's got masks and it's got two masks on it. It's got a curvature mask and it's got a normal mask. And the curvature mask means that it's masking where this texture goes based on the curvature of the geometry. And then the normal mask means that it's masking where it's going based on the normal direction. Uh, think of it as like slope angle. So if I turn those off so that it doesn't have any masks at all, then this uh, material is being layered on top everywhere. And so I'll start like that where, okay, it's everywhere. What is this Icelandic rocky ground? Well, if we get close to it, you can see it's kind of like a dark gravel, basically, if I get super close to it. So it's kind of like dark dirt. But then if I select it and I add a mask to it, that's a procedural mask. I can say, well, I don't want you to go everywhere. I want you to just be applied to the geometry based on curvature. So let's try and make that easier to visualize. Let's make a new solid layer. Okay. So I just made a new solid layer that's like white. That's underneath the one we were just working on, the Icelandic rocky ground. Okay. Let's get closer in here. So if I go to it again and I turn off that curvature mask, it goes everywhere. Turn the curvature mask on and we can see that it's applying that gravel only to parts of the geometry that have curvature changes. 
and you can apply uh, or you can tweak tightness and levels for how it's doing that. So I'm going to go in here and look and decide, okay, well, how do I want that to be applied based on, let's say, the tightness of the curvature? So I can have it really just be like a really tight cavity map kind of thing, like you'd see in, uh, let's say, ZBrush. Or I can lower that tightness down so that it's a little bit more broad. And then I'm going to turn that off. Now it's everywhere. And then the other mask that I have in here is called normal. So I'm going to turn that on. And what that is doing is applying it based on kind of like the slope angle. So you can see that this is only going, it's not going on the parts of the surface that are pointing up. So it's like the opposite of a snow mask, right? Like a snow mask would apply snow on top of things or like dust would be on top of things. And so that's based on this mask right here. So I could go and adjust it based on this normal attribute. So it's got this angle slider, angle and tilt. So right now the angle is 90 and the tilt is zero. So if I rotate that, or rather, let's switch it from above to below. I'm just sort of play with these guys. We can start to adjust where this mask is being applied. Okay, so now it's kind of the opposite of what it was. So now we're seeing that we are getting a lot of this dirt on the ground here, but we're not getting as much of it on parts of the geometry that are flat. So since I swapped the geometry, that's kind of uh, what worked for the other mesh is maybe different than for this one. So it's just a matter of deciding which I like, which one I like better for this. And that's kind of subjective. So that's why I'm just kind of thinking while I look at it. Well, I think I prefer it kind of being more like that. And we'll tweak it more once we get everything together. Also gonna take a look on the other side. So yeah, inside here, I might not want it to be that way. So I'm just experimenting. So this is when I'm gonna start getting the music to be a little louder because now that I'm actually texturing this thing, I just wanna think. So I'm going to hide that solid. Don't need that anymore. I'm going to delete it. Go back to the mask. I'm going to turn the curvature back on.
next one in here, this one I don't know if I'm going to use. It's a charred brick wall. That's something that for the cave entrance I needed, but I don't think I need it here. So if I turn that on, you're going to see this sort of brick wall appear in certain places. I mean, I could always put it on the floor and the bottom, but we're not really going to see that. Let me see. That's got a paint mask right now. So I'm going to delete the paint mask. Now it's everywhere. I'm going to switch it to a box projection. So again, this I needed to switch to a box projection just because uh, the UVs are a little crooked. And so for something like bricks, it looked a little funny. feels too big. I'm just tweaking the lighting. So yeah, so if I only want this on the floor instead of everywhere, then I need a paint mask. So I'm just going to go and add a paint mask onto this thing. Set the value to be black. And then I'm just painting out where I don't want these bricks. So I'm painting them off the walls, but I might keep the bricks at the entrance to the cave so that maybe that cave entrance is uh, more like a man-made thing. Switching to mask view is a little easier in case you want to have it on the ground. Mask view meaning switching this to just seeing my active mask. So yeah, that's useful just to see what spots I missed. So that was a good idea. Thank you for that. So always open to tips or anything because I don't profess to be a master of Mixer. I only started using it last month just to texture a few things with the fellowship. But what's nice about it is that I was able to just like, I need to texture something quickly and install Mixer and fairly quickly be texturing things and feel okay about it.
New question, what does it mean when PBR values are too dark? Um, I'm not quite sure I follow that question. Um, I mean, ultimately, the texturing I've been doing so far with Mixer is using the Megascans materials, which are all supposedly following a PBR workflow, where things like the albedo need to be a certain you know brightness relative to what is expected. And so based on the rendering engines you're using, is it PBR, is it linear color space, et cetera, might determine how you set things like a translucency map or how you set something like a albedo. But what I found is things are so wissy-wig now, like what you see is what you get, that what you're texturing in Mixer is that as long as what it looks like in viewport is what you want, you should be safe. as opposed to using, let's say, because if I'm texturing in Mixer with the intent of going to Unreal, where it's all viewport and GPU based, that's different than texturing in Mari where your final render might be with Arnold. So what you see in Mari, you have to be make sure it's gonna look correct for what it looks like in your final renderer. So at this point, I've got basically these five things kind of blocked out. And now I can start adjusting. Where things go. So I'm gonna turn everything off again. Uh, how often do you work with UDIMs? Um, not too often because I just uh, haven't been texturing things that you know require me to be super, super close to a small area of a single mesh. That's really when you need UDIMs. Um, but uh, generally for like characters, I'll usually have at least uh, a couple like one for the head and one for the body, just so that you can do close-ups of the face um, with the assumption you're not, I'm not going to be doing close-ups of the hand. But if I was going to have a character where it was going to be a close-up of the face and close-ups of the hand, you might need a UDIM for the face, a UDIM for the hands, and then a UDIM for the rest of the body. So you really have to kind of know um, how your character is going to appear on screen to figure out how many UDIMs you need. So if your characters, if you're going to be rendering at 4K and you're going to be doing a close-up of the eye, then that's where you might need, you know, multiple UDIMs just for the face. So, um, but for the stuff I do, which is like personal work and making like illustrations and stills, um, I find that it's a lot easier to just have a super high-res texture, like a 16K map on something, um, as opposed to having UDIMs and a bunch of 4K. Because like life would be easier if you could just have 32k textures on everything, obviously, but there's a lot of reasons why you can't. Like 8k is basically the max you can export from Mixer, for example, and as far as Unreal goes, I'm, I believe 8k is the limit. But for V-Ray and Redshift, I've used 16k textures before.
Uh, Kyle, I just saw your comment. Um, yeah, this is just a single zero to one UV region. So there's some, there aren't multiple UDIMs on this. All right, so I'm just gonna play with this guy to see if, uh, right now it has that. I'm gonna play with masks on this guy. So I'm going to add a mask stack. So on a material and mixer, you can have a paint mask, which is like a layer mask in Photoshop. And then you can have the procedural masks like I was showing earlier. So on this one, I just added a procedural mask. So I got to choose what type. And so you can see that there are different types in here. So you've got uh, noise patterns, normal curvature and a position gradient. So I'm going to play with this one and try curvature. So I can see what this is doing now. So before I added the mask, this uh, layer is everywhere. And by adding this mask, I'm limiting where it is. And by limiting where it is, I'm just trying to create some variation across the cliff face so the whole thing doesn't look the same. Hello, Shape Master. Marlo, am I planning to stream again with my personal account? At some point, for sure. Um, you know, I, I did a little bit of it before the fellowship. And uh, I think I still just need to get used to the whole streaming thing because it still feels odd. But I would like to because it is actually, even though it's odd, like it's it's still a fun thing to do and it's, forcing me to work on my project, which is super awesome. I think what I need to get used to is the fact that like, I feel like I have to keep talking <laughs> because I'm used to teaching at Nomen where it's like you're teaching. So you're doing a presentation and as opposed to just, you know, putting music on and just working in silence. And uh, it's different when you're, if you're working on a personal project where you're trying to actually like make stuff, it's sometimes you need to think. And that's when I tend to get quiet and then I feel like I'm not supposed to get quiet. I don't know, just getting used to it. Play with different curvatures. So I'm going to hide that one, try a different one. Uh, thank you. You see the synth? Uh, yeah. So I've been into making music for since I was a teenager, but uh, just for fun, like just for myself, as far as what kind of music. Um, I don't really have a good classification for it. I'll try noise. I know that was a bad answer. I would say more like ambient on the with the synth and guitar stuff. Dark ambient, I'd say.
texturing an object just in Photoshop. I mean, I did that for a long time for 3D Paint. Although 3D Paint's been around for a while, but sometimes it's just faster to do it in Photoshop. These days, obviously, with things like Mixer, it's just so much more fun to do it in 3D. So that's about as much time as I'm going to spend on that. So I'm going to save it. So chamber entrance, save. Lower that out. Because there's no reason for me to spend more time texturing it. <clears throat> because, you know, we've spent probably like an hour on it or 45 minutes. And really, at this point, I just need to get it into the scene and see, uh, based on the lighting, uh, if it would need to be adjusted. And so that's why this is kind of like a fine start point. And then, you know, if ultimately in the scene is going to be very, very dark, there's going to be a glow coming from the cave entrance. And so with like the fog glow that's in this area and a pitch black scene that's lit kind of by moonlight, really, it's the high frequency details that we are concerned with. And so if I kind of look, make it look like this by rotating the light around, that's kind of what I'm more interested in. And so, you know, as opposed to what it looks like when front lit. So when this thing is front lit is where, you know, there may be issues in wanting to retexture this thing, but, or spend more time on it. But when it's side lit, as long as it looks like it's got a bunch of high frequency detail that makes it look like it's a big rocky thing, then I think it's kind of fine. We're probably going to be focused on the character anyway. So I've got this thing basically sculpted and textured and I saved it. So now I can export these textures. So to export the textures, um, another thing is I'm not using uh, displacement maps inside here. Uh, meaning that uh, Quixel Mixer can create displacement maps for you. Uh, and there's a button here that says preview displacement. And uh, so that's with it on or off. It's pretty subtle as far as what it's doing on the mesh right now anyway, but I have it off. Um, if I was going to be rendering with like V-Ray or Redshift and Maya, then I'd probably be using the displacements. But for Unreal, um, again, I'm still learning Unreal, so I get a little worried about not wanting to have textures that are too high res or use displacement maps on everything like I would in Maya. Um, and so I kind of try to not use it and then decide later if I need it. And that's kind of what I did in my project, like no displacement maps until there was something that was so close to camera where I was like, ah, I think that actually needs a displacement map to look better. So I'm going to export the map now. Exporting them is super easy. So. We've got our layers, got the setup. We've been working with 4K. So I go to the export tab in here and under export, I have to specify my export location. So uh, it's set to what I had been using when I was working on the bridge for the project. And so, and I think, you know, we've been going for, we're like kind of at the halfway point. And so we may have some people that have joined uh, since and so I think just so, again, we're on the same page, what I'm going to do is uh, 
let me just grab my the animation real quick. So let's go to E Unreal Unreal Fellowship Project. Not there. Fellowship Project. And here, here's my renders. And here's the short. All right, so I'm gonna turn off the volume. So I'm just gonna scrub a little bit. Okay, so this is all considered to be the bridge, right? The outside, the cliffs and the bridge. So, but now we're basically entering the cave. So like, go to the end. Right, so we're entering the cave now. So I'm probably gonna put these textures in a different directory. Instead of it being called bridge, it'll probably be called cave. Um, so, so let's see, I'm going to go to Maya projects, Tartarus source images, which is always where I put textures. So I already have a folder in here called cave because I already worked on those stairs. So that's where I want the textures for this thing to go. So my Maya project, Tartarus, Source Images Cave. And then the textures from Mixer are going to go into that directory. And then once I load them into Unreal, then Unreal is going to move them into my project directory. So uh, let me go and specify the export location to be Source Images Cave. And then it's going to create a subfolder called chamber entrance. So by default, if you've saved your mixer project, so I save this to be called chamber entrance, then it's going to assume that's what you want the texture to be called. And it by default will create a subfolder. So in my Maya project source images cave, it'll create a subfolder called chamber entrance. And in there is where it's going to put the textures for this thing. So now is when I specify what maps I want. And basically, um, since I'm using uh, going to Unreal, I'm just using the default texture preset, which is metalness. And in here, the textures I want are basically uh, just the albedo, the roughness, and the normal. And so I don't need uh, displacement. I don't need the AO, and I don't need the metalness. So it's really just these three maps uh, that I need. So if I decide later that I want displacement, I can re-export this and export the displacement. I could export it now just so I have it, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to use it. Um, Don Muell, uh, when can we watch the whole thing? It looks so good. You mean the short? Um, that's on Vimeo, but the Vimeo link I would need to the easiest thing, if you want to watch it, is to go to my website, just alexalvarez.com, uh, which I don't update often enough. But if you go there at the top of the homepage, you'll see a link to the Vimeo, uh, the Vimeo link for it. Um, but uh, yeah, these are the maps I want. And then all the way on the bottom, down here next to the button that says export, which is hidden by my webcam. But if you look at my webcam and you look to the left, well, it's probably a really small font for you guys. Sorry about that. Um, it says 4K. So I could switch it to 8K if I thought I was going to need 8K for this. But I'm going to leave it at 4K. So I'll just err on the side of, you know, smaller. And then once I get to the final shot, um, if this thing looks like it needs an 8K texture, I'll decide then. That That's kind of how I've been doing it. It's kind of been working fine because generally 4K has been okay for everything. Because I just know, again, for this shot, between depth of field and atmospherics and fog and the lighting, it's unlikely that I'm going to need an 8K map. Because once you have depth of field, then that also blurs things out and you know it's going to hide detail. So yeah, so it's basically albedo, roughness, and normal is what I'm going to export. So I'll click the export button. And now it's exporting. So in the lower left corner, it says exporting maps. And now it's done. So the thing that's kind of interesting is that with Mixer is the whole being able to export at a different resolution than the resolution that you're working at. And it's basically because as far as I know, you know, it's it's 
it's importing those materials based on the resolution that you downloaded them from bridge i'm assuming um and so if these are downloaded as 8k maps even though you're working at 4k it's still under the hood sees the full resolution textures and can export at a higher res which is nice so those are exported so if i now go out here you can see in my Maya project in source images cave, there's now a new directory that Mixer made called chamber entrance. And inside there, you can see are the maps. So cool. So I've got my albedo, my normal, and my roughness. All righty. So the next thing now is I would go to ZBrush and start working on the geometry that surrounds this thing, the larger geometry. So we're not going to probably bring this into Unreal just yet because I want to get some of the other stuff built out that we're going to need for this. Um, but since we're, let's see here, let's close this out. Let's close this out. Let's close this out. Do I still have Unreal open? I do. Got this project open, which we don't need. Um, yeah, and part of the other reason for that is that I still need to decide um, how I'm going to set up my project for the cave stairs. And what I mean is if I go and uh, let's close this out. I'm going to open the stairs again. If I go to Epic Games Launcher, the project for the short, the Unreal project, I don't know if I'm going to use that project lifts and the bridge and all that stuff for the cave for the underworld i might split it into two different projects and i haven't decided that yet so the one that i have that i showed you with the stairs is kind of like a test i was just testing if i could do a tileable displacement map uh to make stairs and that's where uh it worked but that's like a test level so I think what I really need to do between now and the next stream is figure out the actual project structure I'm going to use for uh, the inside of the cave. Well, let's go stair test. Yeah. So again, this is like a test level, basically. So if I go and hit F11, well, let's hit play and hit F11 just to make it full screen. So. Yeah, so this was just more of like a test. So for next week, what I need to do is basically get this into the actual Unreal project I'm going to use, and then we can start importing the stuff that we're making in ZBrush and texturing with Mixer, because it would be all the way down here, because this guy needs to travel across this whole divide. And you see how there, there's that glow on the horizon that we're approaching? That's going to be the cave entrance. Right now, it's just a stand in point light. So you can see that we're kind of getting closer to this point light that's here. But it would be way further than this because the size of this room is more like a mile across. So if we get out of full screen and hit escape and hide the light fog, see, it's just kind of like a test level. The only thing I have in here are the stairs. Here, let me go and select this. So all I have in here are like this huge staircase with this tileable displacement map on it. I still need to finalize what the light is going to look like. So, because that'll be the fun thing is once I finalize that, then on a stream, we can start doing all the set dressing because this is also a temp texture for the ground, uh, which I will also do in Mixer. So this is something I made in Mixer. It's a tileable 4K or 8K texture where I'm layering a few different uh, Mixer materials together. Um, so yeah, so since I don't have that, then we can't really... Go. So we're going to go to ZBrush. And so I'm going to launch ZBrush, but we're going to take a quick break. And so what I'm going to do for that is, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, I'm just going to play my short again so that uh, those who haven't seen it can just see it here instead of having to jump to my website. And then I'll be back in when it's over, which is a couple minutes, because I need to get something to drink. So I'll be back in a second. And in the meantime, here's the short again. Well, 
I am back and I have a drink. Um, all right, so I'm going to switch back over to ZBrush. Um, Don Manuel, why does Unreal have AO input, but it doesn't do anything? I don't know. Uh, the material that I've been using is uh, the Megascan material, even for like the Megascan master material. So when you downloaded something from Bridge, the material that it uses for those imports and that's what i'm using for my own stuff and it's not using ao either so i did try bringing the the ao export in and uh, i agree it didn't seem to do anything but i don't know enough about Un unreal yet to answer that intelligently um uh thank you all right so what are we gonna do I am in ZBrush, so we're going to sculpt the uh, region of cliff that's around that entrance. So I just noticed, though, in ZBrush that uh, I don't have my alphas loaded. So if you, I just launched ZBrush 2021. And uh, yeah, we're talking about the material input in uh, Unreal. So in Lightbox, if I go to alpha, you'll see that I've got some directories that I've added to my alpha directory and the ZBrush install directory, which has a bunch of alphas that I've made. And I can load these in one at a time. But what I want to do is get them, get some of them just preloaded uh, into the alpha palette inside here, just so I don't have to load them in one at a time. So the easy way to do that is Again, if we look at the alpha palette, these are the default alphas that ZBrush has when you launch it. And so I'm just going to add to here. And so basically, I just can close ZBrush. And so I'm looking at the install directory for ZBrush. So if I go to ZBrush 2021 in here, 
and I go to the Z alphas folder, you can see all these directories that I added, right? So these are like my alphas that I use for different stuff that I've made. Um, I've made, all of these are ones I've made. I think this one called Terra is one that I got online a while ago, but I don't really use, but I've got a bunch of other ones. So anyway, they're in the alphas uh, directory. I wanna move something to the Z startup. So if I go to program files, pixel logic, and I go to 2020, where I already did this. If I go into Z startup alphas, this is going to be things that are going to, at startup, load into the uh, alpha palette. It's going to take a RAM. So if you're not going to use them, you don't want to keep them in here. But for now, I'm just going to grab all these alphas and use them. And these are alphas that I made myself by doing uh, depth grabs off of geometry, off of photogrammetry assets. So if you take like, you know, if you can make these yourself really easy now, because if you go into uh, bridge, so let's say I launch bridge. Oh, it's already loaded. So if you go into bridge uh, inside here and you grab if, and you look at any of these meshes, um, and you can see this new one looks kind of cool. Let's see what this is. Hello. It's being a little slow for some reason. Massive shrubland terrain. Huh, I haven't seen terrain, terrains in Mixer before. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, that's cool. So let's see, it's got different stuff. So that is a surface <clears throat> that obviously has a displacement map. So you could use that displacement map in ZBrush if you wanted to. And so if you go into your settings, you know, and your download settings, you can choose what it downloads. So like that's downloading a displacement and you could use that displacement in ZBrush, you know, to make your own alphas. Um, and then for models, if we go into 3d assets and let's say we look at like rocks. So let's go in here and look at something like, like this cliff. So for this cliff, basically we can see that for this, if you get the 3d model, and you get the Z tool because in Bridge, it allows you to download the Z tools for a lot of things, the ZBrush file. You could then do a grab doc to pull the depth information and get an alpha. So I'm going to go back in here. I'm going to grab all of these alphas. I'm going to copy them. I'm going to go to ZBrush 2021 go into Z startup alphas and paste those in here. And then let's see, do I have materials? I have materials in here. Okay, so I'm gonna relaunch ZBrush. And these alphas are just first, you know, I, I may or may not need them, but I like having them loaded. Okay. So I'm just going to make my document a little bigger. All right, so now if you look in my alpha palette, you can see I've got all of these alphas loaded. <clears throat> so if I were to, you know, make something, let's say I go and make a plane and I drag this plane and on this plane, oh, let me just make polymesh 3D on this thing. And then I'm just going to divide it up a little bit. So it's like a million polys. 
So if I now switch to drag rectangle, I just have a bunch of alphas. So if I grab a default ZBrush alpha and increase the Z intensity on this, you can see what that's doing. Um, and if I grab one of the ones that I loaded, then basically they're kind of like, you know, useful for making rocky stuff. So I can go and grab other alphas inside here. And grab another one. And so you can see it's just a way to block out rocky looking forms. So if I undo a few steps, a whole bunch of them. So by having a bunch of them loaded, it's kind of convenient because I can just basically go in and just randomly grab different ones. and start to block out stuff that would take a long time to sculpt manually because anybody who's tried to sculpt a rock themselves knows that it's not easy. Rocks have their own anatomy to them, obviously. So whether I'm making something large or small, these alphas work pretty well, <clears throat> which is pretty cool. So. Let's go back to our Z tool. So I'm going to load the one for the chamber entrance that we were playing with earlier. Let's see, Maya projects Tartarus and ZBrush chamber entrance. All right. So this is the next thing that we're going to work on is this larger area. So this right now is two and a half million polygons, which is kind of fine because again, since we're going to texture it with a uh, mixer and we're not going to be super close to it. So same thing, a single 4K or 8K map for that is going to be fine. Because from a camera perspective, you know, we'll probably be seeing it from an angle like about here. So technically, like this would need to be 2K worth of information or texture information, just this part of the geometry that we're seeing. And so that's what tells me that this might need an 8K map. In the end, but I guess I'm going to sculpt on this a little bit. So let's see. Let grab my tablet. See if my tablet is working. Seems to be. Okay. I need to remap my tablet. Again, I'm on a different computer than last week, so I just need to change my tablet settings. Mapping, let me get this to just be using one monitor. Because right now I've got three monitors and the tablet was going to all three of them. I just want it to go to my main monitor. Okay. Nifurg. Is that Griffin? Uh, working on the Tartarus project. Working on the entrance of the chamber that's going to have that big Titan head in it. And uh, hopefully can get the whole underworld scene blocked out over the next week or two. We'll see. Okay, so I'm going to go to clay build up. Just going to sculpt on this a little bit more. And that's probably what I'll do for the next half an hour, I'd say. So obviously, I understand if I lose a few people because you've all seen people sculpt in ZBrush. But uh, it's the next thing I need to do. And with sculpting, this kind of stuff 
meaning like natural shapes like rocks and cliffs you know i find that i can be relatively random with it because organic shapes tend to be very random in nature it's really more of a composition issue and i'll probably do it symmetrical for a while and then i'll turn off symmetry eventually so this thing is not this big symmetrical shape Yeah, the stairs are figured out, um, but I need to get it all into like a final Unreal project so I can actually start doing all the set dressing and making the environment like for real, because that file that I did the stairs on is still like a test file. So I don't really want to work on that anymore before I get that into another project, because the project that I actually made the short in like has all these models already loaded in it. So like all the statues and things that I'm probably going to use and a lot of rocks and Megascans assets that I'll probably want to use. So yeah, I need to, even though the stairs are figured out, like there's still a few other things I need to figure out too for down there. So I'm just going to like block out all the geometry for like the main shapes and then figure out the unreal stuff once I'm kind of ready for the final scene assembly. So meaning like I'll ZBrush all the stuff I know that I need to ZBrush and then go to unreal after that. Uh, why do I need an 8K map when you'll have such good detail already with ZBrush? Um, it's for the textures. I'm talking about the textures that I would make with uh, Mixer. Because if you think that I'm going to render an animation out at 2K, meaning HD. So like, let's say I was rendering this out like this and that this render was going to be 2000 pixels wide so because hd is 1920 by 1080 so if i was rendering an animation that was 1920 pixels wide the size of the rendered frame and this wall fills that entire frame then just like this then the texture on the wall would need to be 1920 pixels wide because otherwise if you get closer to it you're just kind of zooming into that texture and it's going to start to get pixelated. So basically, the optimum texture for this object, if I was rendering this 2K wide and the object filled the screen, is 2K. But if the object was going to be back here, there would be no reason to have a 2K texture on it because we're rendering a 2K, but it's only filling half of the frame, so it would only need a 1K texture on it. So what I'm saying is that we're going to be closer to this thing. Like, we're going to be more like this. And so the color map that's on it and the normal map that's on it would need to be 8K so they don't get blurry as we, based on the camera position. So it's not so much about how many polygons it is in the ZBrush. It's more about the textures you're going to wrap around those polygons. How long did rendering take for that short that I played earlier? If that's what you mean, it rendered super fast because it was rendered out of Unreal and Unreal is real time. <clears throat> but when you render out with Movie Render Queue, you can uh, choose some settings to like improve the anti-aliasing over what you're getting in real time. And that can slow it down a little bit. So the short's about two and a half minutes long. So I'd say the total amount of time to render it is probably more like 10 minutes, which is crazy. 
So that whole animation renders in like 10 minutes. That's what's so awesome about Unreal. It's like what you see in the viewport is basically your final output. So when you render, it's kind of like it's doing a screen grab of the uh, of it playing back at 24 frames per second. And that's kind of what, um, kind of how rendering was working, I guess, prior to 426. And then in 426, they added the movie render queue where you've got uh, these um, variables that you can set to add uh, improved depth of field, motion blur, anti-aliasing settings. It slows it down a little bit, but barely. I think I'm going to divide this again. So now I'm at nine and a half million polygons. I think for next week, <clears throat> I'll try and get this stuff finished for next week so that we don't do the same thing next week, meaning taking this into Mixer and texturing it, because it's going to be kind of the same thing that we did today. So ideally for next week, I can get this stuff done, get it textured, and then next week, uh, maybe we can spend more time in Unreal. Ultimately, I'd kind of like to avoid being in ZBrush. It's just where I'm at on the stream. Only because there's, you know, over at uh, Pixelogic's Twitch channel, they've got so many people streaming, so many awesome people doing, like, really cool stuff that, uh, you know, there's a lot of great content by really cool people. So I think it might be more interesting for you guys if I do something other than ZBrush. I just kind of need to get a few things ZBrushed before I can move on. At 10 minutes, it's crazy. I mean, it's like, and ultimately it's like, it looks really good. You know, it's like the fact that it's got motion blur and depth of field and like all these things and, you know, volumetric um, shadows in the volume fog and like all these things that with, you know, offline renderers typically slow things down quite a bit. You know, like generally, like with Redshift, if you turn on depth of field, you really have to crank your samples because it gets really noisy. 
Um, and then that slows down your render a lot. But with Unreal, you turn on depth of field and you know it's probably doing a similar depth of field hack, like using the Z buffer to create depth of field like we would do with a Z depth pass and like Nuke or After Effects to fake depth of field and post. But ultimately, you know, it's regardless of how it's doing it, it looks really good. It's got bokeh, um, meaning like the blooming that you see on like bright light sources and hot spots. And it's just, uh, but it doesn't slow down your rendering. So you're still getting real time rendering with motion blur and all these effects. It's kind of nuts if you're used to coming from things like Arnold or whatever. So it's cool. There's, I don't know if you all have seen it. I just saw it this morning. What's it called? There's a new short that just came out. That's awesome that you guys should watch. Let me give you the name. Uh, say the wrong one because I just watched it. It's uh, using some of the big, medium, small assets. Uh, da, 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 by uh, Sava Ziskovic. And it's called Irradiation. So here, I'm going to go and show you guys where the link is for it. Here we go. This I just watched today, and it is super cool, made with Unreal. Um, and so, yeah, so it was just posted 10 hours ago. So I highly recommend if you guys are into, you know, seeing some Unreal shorts. Uh, this one is really, really, really cool. 10 minutes long, really cool sound design. And, uh, and according to Sava, he's got another video. There's a link down here. That's like a, uh, process video. And in this process video, he talks about, uh, sort of like a making of, and he says that they only worked on this for a month. Um, and a lot of the things that are impressive and amazing about unreal, meaning the interactivity for iterating is just, you know, it's, it's so many people are trying it out because it's so amazing to be able to you know have your animation and your characters and your effects and your rain and your fire and everything is just in real time and you're blocking your shots and it's i don't know unreal is really really neat so we live in very cool times to be a 3d artist because things are just getting more and more fun to use. 3D has always been fun. Like I never thought it wasn't fun, but like I wouldn't want to go backwards. Like the idea of going back to like 1997 and using Maya version one on the computers from back then, it would be painful because compared to what we're used to now, it was slow. We didn't necessarily think of it as slow because it was new and exciting but anyway unreal is really neat so watch that short so it kind of had uh i don't know if you guys have seen that series called dark which is from germany it's on netflix really really cool it kind of had some vibes of that i thought dark was a really cool show So, but yeah, for pretty much most of the stuff I made for this project, like I tried to limit my time in ZBrush for any specific thing to no more than like 30 minutes to 45 minutes and then send it to Mixer, texture it and get it into Unreal. It's just like, I didn't want to spend more time than that uh, until camera, until I kind of my shots and then would be like okay this object i need to redo or this object needs 
a little bit more time in ZBrush. So not quite sure what I'm doing other than just making this kind of organic, huge cliff wall thing, which once it's textured, hopefully will feel like it's the correct scale. I'm going to save. Forgetting to save. Uh, Don Muell, with the GrabDoc method you mentioned earlier, are you able to extract depth info from any Megascans asset and turn it into an alpha? Yeah. I mean, basically, any mesh that's in ZBrush, you can grab the depth information and make an alpha. Um, so... You can see under the uh, alpha palette in ZBrush, there's a little button here that says grab dock. And so, you know, if you click that, it's going to go and create an alpha. So I now have an alpha that is basically the depth information of my document. And so that's basically it. And so if I, I don't want to be using that for that, but if I go, let's say to like the standard brush, and I now go and grab that alpha that I just made. Let's go somewhere out here. You can see I made an alpha out of the depth information of my scene, which actually looks kind of cool. So. So that's what it's kind of doing. So you import a piece of geometry, like a cliff face, and then basically just sort of like position the camera, you know, like you just sort of decide the angle that you want to grab the depth information from. And then I would set my document to 2K because my alphas are all 2K. So go to the document. I'd set the document to 2048 by 2048. And then once I position the camera the way I want it to be, then I'll click grab doc and that'll create a 2048 by 2048 alpha in the alphabet. And then I can uh, save that out to disk. And I created a lot of alphas that way. So one cool scan from uh, Bridge or from Mega Scans, you know, one cool cliff scan, you might be able to pull a few alphas off of it. It's kind of neat. So I know a lot of people, you know, make alphas through. Yeah, that's not what I want to do. Let me go to. Okay. A lot of people, you know, make alphas by sculpting, like sculpting from scratch. Um, and that obviously works really well too. So it just really depends what you're doing. Let's lower this down. How are we doing on time? These streams go by bizarrely quickly. Let's see. Better.
Well, Marlo, I definitely think that of all the programs that I use, ZBrush is the one that feels the most like traditional media, you know, meaning like you're just sculpting, you're not using a lot of tools. So if you're somebody who likes to draw, has a traditional background, ZBrush is really, really, I feel like the most purely creative um, from that point of view. Because obviously sculpting is just a lot less technical than modeling, even though modeling obviously can be expected, very creative. And you see people like Furio Dutetsky who are super fast with hard surface modeling. But yeah, ZBrush is, uh, all these programs, you know, aside from the free ones like Unreal and Blender, some of them are definitely expensive. But the nice thing with ZBrush, you got to remember, is that you get free upgrades for life. So you only pay for it once, as opposed to, you know, things that are subscription-based where you have to kind of keep paying every month. Thanks, Navy. That's awesome. I'm I'm enjoying doing it, so I'm glad that uh, we still have some people in here. It's the funny thing with streams is like you know I've done events obviously at Noman in the soundstage, and it's in person, so you see people and can chit chat and you know getting. I, that's the one funny thing to me in here is that like I can't you know see you guys or hear your voices or so it feels a little impersonal i mean obviously if we did these on zoom then that would be different and i could see people and that could be cool it just would be a very different setup i guess because obviously our classes, like all of our online classes are not done on Twitch. And people are using webcams and seeing each other. I think just that's one of the things with teaching that I always liked is getting to know people, you know, like meeting people, meeting cool people um, and making friends and all that kind of stuff. So being a streamer is kind of like, oh, meet people it's like i see your names but it's abstract live zoom art jam maybe maybe that's the way to go maybe that would be more fun something to think about But that could be like in addition to this, meaning like, you know, Josh and I can still do the Twitch streams and maybe add something different that we do on another day. You know, not that I'm in love with Zoom either. I think after a year and a half of COVID, we're all kind of sick of Zoom too. Not the biggest fan of Zoom. I mean, it's amazing, and thank God for Zoom, because how would we have all gotten any work done over the last 18 months? But still. All right, what am I doing? I'm going to focus on just the edge here.
trying to figure out. Because obviously there's more wall to the outside of these things. What the hell are you doing? Why is that stuff getting screwed up on the outside back there? All right, I'll have to fix that later by just mirroring the geometry. Because for some reason it got tweaked, so I could have accidentally had a mask. Maybe? Let's see. That's not that many steps back, so let's take a look. Thank you, Marlon. All right, well, now we have the spinning blue wheel, so it's a good thing I saved not too long ago. All right, ZBrush is thinking about something and I'm gonna let it think. That's one thing I'm sure some of you have noticed with ZBrush when this happens. <clears throat> ZBrush is not responding, close the program, wait for it to respond. Uh, usually if you wait for it to respond, it will come back. Maya, not so much. If Maya gets into this kind of loop, there we go, see it's back. You know, you can pretty much count on Maya being hosed. All right, let's go actually forward a little bit. I went back too far. That's what I did is I went uh, like 500 steps back in the undo history. My undo history is too big. So now it's going to take a second. I know I should have saved right in between those two moments. <clears throat> okay. So I can kind of see what the problem is. <clears throat> My geometry is, uh, we're sculpting symmetrically, but the geometry, <clears throat> one moment. <clears throat> um, don't you hate it when you swallow the wrong way? <clears throat> Evolution fail. So my geometry is we're sculpting symmetrically, but there's a little bit of uh, extra space on the left side than on the right side, which is weird, but I'm not going to get hung up on that. So I can see in here, I'm just going to ignore it, but it, that's why when I got to the edges, I got those artifacts. And so... Sometimes when things like this happen, you just gotta just roll with it because what am I gonna do? Like, it doesn't matter what's going on on the edge there. I can easily resolve this by turning off symmetry and I'm just gonna do what I was doing on the edges on each side. It's fine. So I'm gonna switch back to clay buildup. And just do it over. And I'll just save from this point. Now, one thing I did over the last few days, instead of working on my project, which maybe I shouldn't have done, is I played a couple video games. I don't know what games you guys are playing. But I spent a while playing Little Nightmares 2. And you guys play Little Nightmares. That game was really cool. And then the sequel came out a while ago, and then I forgot to play it. And then I started playing Control on the PS4. 
which is also pretty cool, super trippy. I don't know if I'm going to finish it, though. It's cool, but like crazy in love with it. Yeah, Little Nightmares 1 was so awesome, so weird. And Little Nightmares 2, I'm only maybe like three hours into it. But it's totally got the same vibe. And it's made in Unreal, which is cool. Now that's one weird thing about starting to learn Unreal is that while, you know, my use of it right now is, you know, just doing 3D scenes and, you know, making that short for the fellowship, uh, ultimately it is a game engine. So not that I have any plans on making a game, but it's just cool to be learning something that you could. Uh, Senua's Sacrifice, I played it a little bit. I, I, that's another one I want to get back to. Um, I think I played maybe only like two hours, and that was like when it came out. So that's definitely on my list of a game that I'd love to play. So is it worth playing all the way to the end? Like, I know it's a smaller team, and, like, since I had, you know, played Witcher 3, I was like, I didn't know if I was going to be disappointed playing, like, a smaller game at the time, because I was playing, you know, Witcher 3 and Assassin's Creed. And, uh... It's got a cool tone. The last trailer they made for it was awesome, with that, like... What's the name of that band? Sort of, like, Viking band. I saw them live. And I'm blanking on their name. That Senua's Sacrifice trailer where they're like, there's the fire and she's chanting and singing. Yes, Heilung, thank you. So yeah, that trailer came out and obviously it was like uh, super, super cool. And then it turned out that Heilung was playing in LA only like a couple months later. And so we got to go see them live. It was really cool. Like, I highly recommend seeing them live. It is very theatrical. It's cool. And it was a crazy crowd. Like, there were a lot of people dressed up for that show. Battlefield, not so much. And not for any reason. Like, I just tend to play... I, mean, I guess there's a reason. I tend to play fantasy RPG type games, you know, like and uh, or games like you know Diablo. Like I can't wait for Diablo 2 Resurrected to come out um, because Diablo 2 is definitely one of my favorite games, more so than three. Um, so bad the Battlefield games. I think they'd be a lot more fun to play with friends than to play like the single player campaign. And I tend to be uh, into single player games. Tribes of Midgard, I have not. Is that on Steam? I don't know if I've sounds familiar like maybe i've seen it advertised on steam hey i don't want to be on blob
didn't play death stranding either that one didn't the trailers were cool and i love the trailers and the vibe of them but when i watched some of the gameplay videos on youtube and twitch just didn't seem like my cup of tea seemed like a lot of walking around i don't know and i watched a couple of review videos that people kind of put me off from it where it just looked frustrating and i you know i have limited time to play games unfortunately i wish i had way more time so like last year i played a lot of games but i kind of played games that like i felt i had to play that i really wanted to like god of war and last of us one last of us two uncharted for like some of the sort of tentpole games and i kind of felt like i needed to play those and obviously they were amazing red dead redemption 2. um but i played so many games last year that now i, I felt kind of guilty so now i feel like this year i'm not really doing as much Awesome. Um, Vertice models. I don't know if I said that right, but that's really cool. All right. So this is kind of at a point that just throw textures on it and bring it over to the mixer. So I'm going to now smooth out a lot of this stuff because a lot of the clay tubes detail that's in here I don't need. Save it first before I do that. Yeah, Red Dead is nuts. So I didn't completely finish it. Um, I was playing it with my son and I'd say we got like halfway through it together and then he played a bunch on his own so I didn't get to see a bit of it. Um, so I'd say like I've probably played like half of it. So he keeps telling me that like I need to play it on my own and finish it. But it's a big game, so to start over is kind of uh, a lot of time. But yeah, the attention to detail in Red Dead is insane. The environments are so well done. I mean, everything about them, models, textures, lighting, atmospherics, time of day changes, like all that stuff. Man, I mean, Red Dead is amazing. Like, it's definitely one of those games that I didn't think would be for me because I tend to like fantasy RPGs. I tend to like games that have, you know, magic and sorcery and, like, you know, obviously just a big Frazetta Tolkien guy. And so Red Dead was something I was like, nah. Like, I like Westerns as far as movies, but as far as the game goes, but man... It's like same with Last of Us. Like I'm not a big zombie person. I don't don't watch Walking Dead. So I thought Last of Us was just going to be another zombie game. And Last of Us is definitely not just another zombie game. Yeah, Red Dead's long. Anybody in here play Last of Us 2? Because holy crap, that game. My brain hurt at the end of that. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, Last of Us 2, you know, sometimes when I finish a game, I might write something up on Facebook. <clears throat> so, like, if you go to my Facebook page, um, 
you know, you'll see what I had to say about Last of Us when I finished it because I just felt compelled to write something because holy crap, that game. Yeah, definitely, like, I think I enjoy Last of Us 1 more. Like, it was more satisfying because I think they kind of gave you what you wanted and what you expected, which Last of Us 2 was definitely, like, a lot of raising the eyebrows of, like, oh, so, yeah. But, dude, it's amazing. Yeah, it's nuts. And now they're making the series. <clears throat> and I guess Neil Druckmann is involved in that. So super curious about that. I mean, generally, historically, movies and shows made out of video games aren't great. So we'll see. But I want it to be good because, you know, there's so many people out there that will never play the game. People that are just not gamers. And it's such a good story. And it's so well done. And it's so cinematic. Same thing with Uncharted. Like, you know, Uncharted 3, Uncharted 4 could totally be movies. I mean, they already are kind of movies. So, like, in my mind, you know, Joel and Ellie or Nathan Drake are characters that, you know, the general public who are not gamers would still fall in love with those characters. They just need to be turned into movies or TV shows. But with the amount of content getting made by right now, everything that's decent is going to get turned into a show, it seems like. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the new God of War 2. Did they say when that's coming out? I assume not. That's probably got to be like a ways out. Yeah, I mean, it's totally Indiana Jones. But I love Indiana Jones. Although I did just rewatch uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Temple of Doom um, a couple months ago, a month ago. And Raiders of the Lost Ark is amazing, and, um, but Temple of Doom, I mean, it was never my favorite one, but rewatching it, I don't think it aged very well. Yeah, they're making another Indiana Jones movie with Harrison Ford, I believe, which is unfortunate. <laughs> Because the Crystal Skull one was, I don't know, I thought it was really bad. I don't think I'm the only person who thought that. I think I maybe missed a couple comments, so I'm just going to scan real quick. What incoming games are I most excited about? Well, I mentioned Diablo 2 Resurrected, so that's the soonest one coming out that I'm really looking forward to. Because I I played Diablo 2. Like, I still dis really distinctly remember playing Diablo 2 <clears throat> and uh, finishing it. Because I was played Diablo 2 on uh, a MacBook laptop 20 years ago. Nomen was still pretty young because Nomen was started in 97. So in 2000, which is when Diablo 2 came out, um, you know, Noblo, Nomen was only three years old, but I was invited to go to Japan by a school there um, to do a talk and to speak at like their opening ceremonies or something. Anyway, it was a long time ago. 
And, uh, but it was like all expenses paid trip to Japan to be a speaker. Like they flew us business class and put us in a nice hotel. And like, it was pretty awesome, you know? And, uh, and anyway, Diablo two had come out and I really wanted to keep playing it. So I installed it on my laptop and thinking that I was going to have Diablo two to look forward to in the hotel room every night. And it was like a eight day, nine day trip to Japan. We went to like Tokyo, Osaka, Fugoka. No, not Fugoka. Tokyo, Osaka, and uh, where did we go to? I'm forgetting the third city. But anyway, I thought I was going to have Diablo 2 to look forward to in the hotel room every night. And I remember I finished it on like the third night in the hotel room. And I was so bummed. That it was over because I thought I was going to do that every night. Um, anyway, best soundtrack ever, Diablo 2. But the thing that's weird is uh, somebody showed like a gameplay trailer of like Diablo 2 versus Diablo 2 Resurrected. And, uh, you know, the original game was only like 800 by 600. And the new one, you know, I think will run at 4K. And it's funny, like you see the new one and it's kind of like what your memory is of the original one. Like, I don't remember the original one looking as low res as it was. Because, you know, at the time, you know, your brain just sort of fills in all the details. Anyway, I'm looking forward to that. And then New World. So my son and I played uh, New World for a bit. Uh, the new Amazon MMO, and actually it was pretty cool. So that was supposed to come out, I think, at the end of this month. They just pushed it back to the end of September. So we're looking forward to that. Hello, Brazil. Watching me from Paris. That is awesome. So I'm actually French, which you may not assume, but I have a French passport. I am a French citizen. So, but I was raised in LA. My mom was French and we moved here when I was a baby. So I was born in Paris, but my parents never taught me. My dad was Venezuelan. My mom never taught me French and my dad never taught me Spanish, which is crazy and it sucks. But so I have family in Paris. I used to go there all the time, but they pretty much all speak English. So anyway, hello, Paris. Can't wait for COVID to be over so I can go back to Paris and visit my family. Final Fantasy. Nope, not yet. So my son watches Asmogold a lot, has for years, and I guess he's playing Final Fantasy now. There's just so many games to play. All right. Well, once this thing is textured, hopefully it inter integrates with this thing down here. <clears throat> but that's something I'll play with in Unreal because to help it integrate, I might add more objects kind of sticking out of this thing like spikes or whatever. But now that I've got symmetry off, I just got to get rid of this, some of this stuff that looks too symmetrical.
Do I visit other schools around the world? <clears throat> it's been a while. I have, I mean, I've been to a few. Um, Japan and Korea, Singapore, Australia, Melbourne, um, Copenhagen. Um, visit a school in Barcelona. Not that many, obviously other schools in the States. Um, like, you know, some of the schools that you would like, you know, think of when talking about Nome and I haven't been to. So because I've only been to Vancouver once, I went to Montreal once, like, you know, because obviously there's schools in Vancouver and Montreal and Paris and London. It's a big planet. Went to Singapore a couple times, which was cool. <clears throat> so Feng Zhu, who taught at Nomen for years, you know, left LA a while ago and moved to China, and then he moved to Singapore, and then he started his school in Singapore. So I went there a couple times. Um, Feng organized like an event, and I spoke at the event and got to visit his school, which was cool. And then at the time, he was in the same building as a school called like 3D Sense, and uh, the guy Sen Lai, who runs that, was super nice and got to see his school. Singapore was cool, really humid, dude. Singapore is a humid place. It's like right on the equator. So it is really hot. Uh, Trumax, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, because me and uh, Leonard Teo, the guy who made ArtStation, um, me and Leonard did an event in Copenhagen, a 3D festival. This is back in like 2006. Cause I've known Leonard forever. And, uh, and so that was in Copenhagen. So we did that two years in a row. And then true max obviously was, uh, at the time, I don't know about these days, but it was like the 3D school there. So I got to meet some people who were who work there and were studying there. Copenhagen is a cool city. I really liked Copenhagen a lot. People were super friendly. Everybody speaks English, which is was super weird. I remember I was there with Darren my partner, um, and we just assumed nobody would speak English. And we were like, first night there, we just got there from the airport and we went to a restaurant to grab some food. And we were speaking to the hostess as if, you know, like, as if she wouldn't speak English, kind of like speaking in like, you know, slowly in like a broken English, asking if we could get a table. And then she just responded in like perfect fluent English, like, oh, you want a table? Just sit over there. And I was like, oh, OK. She speaks English. That's weird. And then the bartender, same thing. And then another waitress, the same thing. And then the whole trip is like, wow, people in Denmark, I guess, start learning English at a really young age. So it makes it really easy to travel. And I guess all of Scandinavia is supposedly kind of like that. Anyway, I need to smooth this thing out and texture it. But I think that we're at five o'clock, which is when this is supposed to end. So I'm going to save. And then if I'm able to sneak it in this weekend, then I will finish all this stuff up. And ideally we don't spend any time in ZBrush next week. Hopefully it's all either mixer or scene layout in uh, assembly in uh, Unreal. So cool. Well, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me today. And uh, hopefully some of it was interesting, but it was nice chatting 
and talking about games. But yep, I'll be back next week. I'll be here every Wednesday until uh, Josh is back from the Unreal Fellowship. So, and I think he's got the fellowship until uh, the first week of September. So I'll be doing this for like another three weeks. And I mean, I'll keep joining Josh once he's back. But as far as it being me solo, um, probably like another three, three or four weeks. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thanks for watching. Have a good rest of your Wednesday and a good rest of your week and have fun with software and making stuff and being creative and good luck with the weird world we live in. But I hope you all have a good day and evening. I'll see you guys later. See you guys next week. Adios.